I was raised by independent people, and so I wanted to continue the tradition, I guess. I never wanted to be a spectator, I wanted to be a player. In 1988, a graffiti-obsessed 17-year-old in Astoria, Queens, had an idea. Sasha Jenkins would combine his love of art, hip-hop, and humor to found a series of highly successful independent print publications before turning his unique lens to television production and then documentary filmmaking. Along the way, he would go from documenting the culture to shaping it, all while providing a template for creativity that's informed countless careers, including mine. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your career ambitions? My dad was a filmmaker, my mom was a painter. So when I look at all the stuff that I've done, it's been a combination of moving pictures and still pictures and storytelling, right? So my parents are storytellers. And so at a young age, that was instilled in me. I would say my parents are my biggest influence, actually. My dad was mainly a documentary filmmaker, one of the founding producers of Sesame Street, the Africa correspondent for a show called Black Journal. So he, there's footage of him all over Africa in the 60s and 70s doing his thing. My dad died when I was really young. And like back then, you know, seeing my dad work, he did a feature film called Cain River that was only recently released after like 40 years, like a couple of years ago. But it was shot in New Orleans. I got to spend the summer there. I was on set. So I was around this stuff most of my life. You were born in Philly and your early life was in Maryland. Yep. But your sort of most formative years happened in Astoria in the late 70s, early 80s. How did that shape your worldview? Astoria was very pol racially polarized, right? Although my building was very mixed, there wasn't much intermingling amongst people. In Astoria, one thing that brought people together was graffiti. That put me in a unique position to learn different things about different people because what I realized is the white kid who likes heavy metal has a boombox and the black kid who likes hip hop has a boombox is the same kid, the same guy. When I was coming up, I was into skateboarding, I was into hardcore music, hip hop, things that are very common today for kids of color. When I was into it, I was a weird old black dude. Now it's like kids in the hood, which is great. Their world is way more broad. I think that's one of the reasons why I've somehow stayed contemporary was my understanding and involvement. It's also for me very important to be directly involved because I learn from hip hop, from hardcore, from graffiti, whatever. Being a practitioner and being involved or understanding these cultures, these subcultures has always been very germane to my evolution. I think having that experience really helped me sort of navigate the world at large. How did you end up with things like punk rock and skating on sort of on your radar? Um, skate, skating was like the 70s. My, I had an older sister and we had a skateboard and, and the first or second real skateboard wave. So when we moved from Maryland, I still had my little skateboard, but I got into BMX before skating. And once BMX started to fade, I got into skateboarding again. A friend of mine named Haji, who I started Beatdown newspaper with, he was into skating too, so we kind of got into it together and we would travel to different places, the skate spots. You'd go to the Brooklyn Banks under the Brooklyn Bridge or the Harlem Banks in Harlem or Bay Ridge or different places. You would travel to go to different skate spots. It was very much like graffiti. Graffiti writers travel all over the place. Skaters travel all over the place. And a friend of mine named Chaka, who was in a, it was wound up being in lots of bands, he grew up in the Woodside Projects. He wanted to get into skating. He knows into rock and he gave me a tape. And I listened to that tape. I didn't know any of the bands. And I asked him about this one specific band. I was like, what's this band right here? He's like, yo, it's the Bad Brains. And guess what? They're black. I was like, get the f out of here. He's like, the Bad Brains, they're all black. I didn't know who the Bad Brains were, whatever. But something about their music spoke to me. And so I was like, I got to buy the record. And he sold me his beat up copy of Eye Against Eye of Bad Brains for like more money than he paid for it. But that was a gateway 
for me to get into a whole other world and one day be in a band with a member of the Bad Brains. How seriously did you take your life as a graffiti writer? I wrote, just like people skate, and there are professional skaters and there are kids who just skate. There are way more kids who just skate than there are professionals, right? So I was a kid who wrote. I wasn't anyone important, I wasn't anyone special. But what I learned from graffiti, between politics, between networking, before the internet, before cell phones, I'm meeting all kinds of kids from all over the place. And it piqued my interest in wanting to do a zine. I did more time thinking about graffiti and writing about graffiti and publishing magazines about graffiti than doing graffiti, but I'm okay with that at this point. My biggest early supporter was my mom. When I told her I wanted to do a graffiti magazine and that it was gonna cost me $1,000 in 1988, I didn't think she'd give me the money and she found the money and gave it to me. That belief in me or just being willing to take a chance was major. What was the auspice for you to actually get into publishing a zine yourself? My friend Chaka, he was on the hardcore scene. And in the hardcore scene, there were zines, right? So it's a combination of hardcore zines and then phase two publisher magazine called International Get Hip Times, which when I purchased that, it just blew my mind. And I wrote to phase two and I was like, hey man, I'm a fan of what this new zine, like I want to do one myself. He wrote me a six page handwritten letter telling me that I could do it. He didn't know me from a can of paint, pun intended, right? But that was like, put a battery in my back. And so my friend Chaka and his friend Freddie Alva did a hardcore compilation tape where they recorded all these bands and put it on a cassette called the New Breed Compilation. And it was in a comic book plastic and it came with a, with a zine, a booklet. I asked him who the printer was and basically, if you, look, if you know the New Breed Compilation and you see my first, the first issue of my zine, it's the same thing. So usually I learn from my friends, right? So I saw what my friends did and it inspired me to do what I did. And, and how did you put together the money to get this printed and figure out the distribution and all that part? I asked my mom for the money. And in 88, asking my mom for a grand was like a, no small feat. And I didn't think she'd be able to get it to me, but my mom gave me the money. And as far as distribution, there was only one or two stores in the world at that time. It was a place on West Broadway called Soho's At. Writers from all over the world would go there because it was around the corner from Henry Chalfont studio. So you'd go to the store and then you'd knock on the door to maybe meet Henry. And so while I was down there selling my zine, me and this guy Hush went over. He's like, let's go knock on Henry's door. Knock on Henry's door. Henry doesn't open up. Carl Weston does. Carl Weston would go on to start something called Videograph. And so all these things just happened the way they happened. All the things that I've done, I've learned from mentors. I've had great mentors. I was able to realize who I needed to get an education from. I tapped into those folks, did what I could to help them. In return, they imparted lots of knowledge on me. Uh, Henry Chalfont, for instance, was a big influence on me. I was a huge fan of his work as a kid. I'd study subway art in my art class. One day I'd go on to meet Henry and he'd become a friend and a mentor. So how many issues of graphic scenes did you create? There's about four issues of graphic scenes that we made. Um, the first two were more elaborate in terms of printing, like spending real money, and then later issues were more like Xerox style. And, and where were you getting like the, you know, all the assets and the photos and all that kind of stuff to fill I out? I was snapping photos, getting some photos from Henry, getting photos from other writers. I mean, in graffiti, photographs are like trading cards, right? So I had some hot, trains that people wanted, so I was able to trade with people. And how many units of this were you selling at the time? Uh, my zine, the first issue, I probably printed up 5,000 copies. Sold most of them. How do you get from creating these four issues to creating the first hip-hop newspaper, Beatdown? So Haji, again, who's a friend I grew up with, Haji Akibade is a guy I grew up with who was into skating, into graffiti, and he was a producer, right? He made hip hop beats and he actually like kind of worked with Marley a little bit, like helping out Marley and stuff. I had gone away to a community college in upstate New York and I worked on the school newspaper and I saw the print bill and it was like 600 bucks. I was like, that's it? I came back to New York 
And I connected with Haji and I said, look, let's do this hip hop newspaper. It only costs whatever, whatever. We went to the printer, which is across the street from Queensbridge Housing Projects. It was like $640.30. We went with exact split in half, cash, change, everything paid for. And, you know, at this point, it's still very nascent stages of hip hop publishing, but the source is happening and is, is, is a pretty big deal by 91, 92. What was it that made you want to create your own platform versus trying to sort of, you know, get a job at, at, at the source or, you know, um, or work within any sort of existing structure? I was raised by independent people. And so I wanted to continue the tradition, I guess. I had no desire to write. I'd, I take great pride and much respect to the source and everyone who's gone through there, but I've never written for the source. I never really wanted to write for the source. Not that the source isn't great, but I, I didn't really care. You know, for me, it's like, for years, sports, I wasn't into sports because I'm like, why am I getting excited about watching sports? It's not me doing it. I could never get into sports watching it, like being a fan, because it's like, what, what do I care about watching someone do it? But once you start to play a game and you understand it, then sports and watching sports and being a spectator becomes more interesting, right? But I never wanted to be a spectator. I wanted to be a player. At its peak, how big did Beatdown get in those initial years that, that you were involved? Beatdown really took off after we left. We were there for a year. Beatdown went on for years and became a magazine and printed and has all kinds of fans all around the world. So when I was doing it, for us success was going to Tommy Boy and knowing that from studying the source, Tommy Boy always took out the back cover. So we knew that that Tommy Boy paying for the back cover cover for a couple of years paved the way. So we went to Tommy Boy and offered them the same deal. And that sort of paved the way for us to have money to publish the magazine if we had no ads for a long time. You mentioned meeting Carl Weston, and I know that you were, you know, pretty heavily involved in some of the seminal editions of uh, Videograph. How did you sort of, you know, fit into that creative matrix? And then what did that platform really offer you? Back then I had a wanted to be a filmmaker and Carl was a want, wanted to be a filmmaker as well. So we had that in common. Carl was older than me and had equipment and we talked about film and things we wanted to do because ultimately Videograph was a platform for him to make money to make films. So I was a younger cat in that matrix and I was just there and then. It was just, it just started to happen. What kind of reach did Videograph have in that moment? I think, you know, it, it's hard for young people today with this ubiquity of the internet to understand, but you know, Carl was selling VHS cassettes, but they, they had reach. Carl used to wear sweatpants and sweatpants pockets are kind of loose. And he, you know, he had knots like this, cash. <laughs> Big ass knots. I mean, it was VHS, right? So people were buying them, but obviously I would say two out of five writers were buying them. And like the other three were just bootlegging this but considering how much it was bootlegged, it got around. Big black Mac with no seeds on my bun. Chucking spears to stun, run frosty run to your unique cave, shelter from the sun. Wanna step to me? That can be fun. Be alone, Yoko, or I'll be out like the flying nun. How did the poetry moments happen? Poetry moments and videograph happened because I was doing poetry. Some of it was really bad, but I liked doing it. It was back when we drank 40s, a drink of 40 and just freestyle poetry. And it was, you know, you do that and then people recognize you on the street. And there was a um, commercial for my magazine and videograph once that was based on a true story where I was walking down West 4th Street and there were the McDonald's that used to be there. And some kid recognized me from Videograph and said something slick. And all I did was I just literally went behind my head and did this. Like, just made a funny gesture. And yo, 25 dudes just started chasing us through the West Village <laughs> and um, yelling Videograph. And I was like, damn, this shit's crazy, man. So they didn't want my autograph, they wanted to hurt me. So you start beat down. And, you know, in that you, you meet 
two very consequential people that would be collaborators with you for years after that, um, in Elliot Wilson and Chairman Mao. Me and Hazi, we did beat down, and I guess Elliot got a copy and called. We had a voicemail, he called the voicemail and said he wanted to be down, so then he got down with us. And then Chairman Mao, I was interning at a place called Third World Newsreel, which has Black Panther films and all kinds of leftist, interesting people of color shit. And the folks there had always told me, you love hip hop, you've got to meet this guy, Jeff Mao. He's a DJ, he loves hip hop. So one day I'm in the elevator, I see an Asian guy with bald cut and a Carhartt jacket. And I'm like, yo, you're Jeff Mao, right? And this is like, you know, 91. And so that's how I met Jeff. And, um, you know, he was a record collector and was very knowledgeable about hip hop. So that was the initial nucleus of Beatdown. And, uh, you know, those are cool times. And after about a year, your relationship with Haji Sowers, you and Mao and Elliot all end up leaving. But what happened that sort of was the catalyst for that? We laugh about it now. It's just a stupidity, just like miscommunication, you know, and misunderstandings and egos and just being young and not really being smart. You know, we look back at it now and we say, wow, we were, we were foolish to do that. But, you know, childhood friends have squabbles. Because ultimately, that's what it was. It didn't have to be that deep. How do you tell a good idea from a bad idea? Well, sometimes a bad idea looks real sexy and tasty. But if you, as soon as you bite into it, it feels kind of funny. Don't let your ego get in the way of this, the hype of what you thought this thing was or what you told people it was. If it's not right, you usually know it and it's time to back up out of it if you can. Beatdown was a strictly hip hop magazine. Shortly thereafter, Ego Trip starts to come into focus and you form a partnership with initially Elliot and then also with Chairman Mao. Mm -hmm. What was the idea for that and, and what was that moment of innovation that brought that together? It's very simple. It was, I wanted it to be more of a re reflection of my life, right? I like skateboarding, I like rock, I like hip hop. And I also thought like, what are we offering? What, what, why does the world need another hip hop whatever? At that point, there were more magazines. So it's like, very simply, if we have other stuff beyond hip hop, it just opens us up to more advertising, right? So skate, rock, whatever, fashion. So I just wanted something that was a little bit more contemporary to kind of how I lived at that point. You have art from Mr. Caves, you know, comic strip called Tales from the Rails. Interviews with skaters, you know, my friend Chris Keefe was in the first issue. Chris is someone I skated with in Queens. He went on to be one of the supreme guys and a uh, professional skateboarder, you know. So it's like, it was more of a reflection of where I felt culture was going. How did you put together the pieces to go get Ego Trip printed and, and then distributed as well? Well, first we had to get money to make it. So that's when I went to Henry Chalfont. So I went to Henry and said, give me 10 grand. And I'll turn that 10 grand into much more than that. And so with that money, I think we got a computer and were able to print like one or two issues. And how did you guys conceive of the sort of business side of this partnership? Business side is, an, is like kind of an overstatement or, or understatement. Or I mean, we were just doing, right? No one was formally trained in business. It's all instincts. That was a time where Everything was very balkanized, right? Between like white magazines, black magazines, you know, women's magazines, men's magazines. Ego Trip obviously lived in the middle of a, a very complicated Venn diagram. When you would take these meetings to try to sell these ads, were the marketing people receptive? Do they understand your vision? There were enough people who did, but there were a lot of people who didn't because they're still putting everything in a box. Like, no. Kids who like hip hop don't like this. Like, what do you mean? Like kids, white kids who like rock love hip hop at this point. Like you can't keep putting people in boxes. There were people who didn't get it, but there were enough people on the advertising side who got it and got us to a point where like, we even had credit with our printer. All of that coming together made Ego Trip possible because again, outside of the 10 grand, we didn't have shit. Having founded three iconic magazines from his bedroom in his mother's apartment, 
Sasha would guide Ego Trip into book publishing and television production. While creative differences would ultimately bring about the end of the group, Sasha's mix of insight, humor, and deep understanding of culture would beget his next move into the world of filmmaking. Initially, it's you, Elliot, and Mao, and then in 1996, Gabe Alvarez joins, and then in 1997, Brent Rollins joined. How did that happen? Gabe was working at a magazine called Rat Pages in LA with Brent. They had a section called Underground Zine where they wrote about zines. And so me and Elliot were flying out to LA to do a Cypress Hill cover story. And um, we met Gabe, he interviewed us for the column in Rat Pages. And we just thought he was cool. And so at one point we're like, yo dude, why don't you come out here and move to New York and work on a magazine. We had no money. I said, but yo, you can stay at my mom's house in Queens. You're good. My mom's good with it. And he's crazy enough to do it. So Gabe came out, moved to a story of Queens and stayed in my bedroom. And uh, soon after, I guess Brent followed suit. And then also, as I remember it, you reached out to us saying that you wanted an intern or something, right? Yeah, I was finishing my senior year um, of high school and I had to get a internship. And I sat there with all the rap magazines. My taste leaned in the indie way. And I looked at On The Go and I looked at Ego Trip and I was like, On The Go looks really pretty, but Ego Trip makes me laugh on every page. Like every, I live for every inside joke, every thing you guys put in the folios and all that stuff. And I just called over and over for two weeks until somebody called me back. And that was, that was how I got down. When Ego Trip started, how did the humor and that voice develop in the magazine? I think if you really look at what we were doing Ego Trip with the ads, the internal ads, those are like early memes. I mean, humor to me is super important. Like, it's a sign of intelligence. If you, if you have no sense of humor, I can't f you, you know? And, I think all of us at Ego Trip have a sense of humor, and there's a level of diversity there. You know, Gabe Alvarez is Mexican from LA, and Brent from LA, he's black and Vietnamese, and Jeff Mao is, you know, Chinese from Massachusetts, and Elliot is Greek, Ecuadorian, and black, and I'm African American and Haitian. So we we covered a lot of ground, and there were a lot of things to laugh at. I mean, I think things are so up. If you can't laugh, you're really up. I would say race in my career in general has been a pretty consistent through line in terms of how I'm trying to communicate with people and have conversations with people. And so Ego Trip was the foundation for that. I think the most important idea I've ever had was to listen to the voice in my head. You're walking around all day, you're by yourself. Who are you talking to? Well, you're talking to someone who's in your head. And the thing about the person in your head Typically, that voice or that individual has your best interests at hand. So I'm not saying the voice is right all the time, but most of the times in my life where I transitioned into something new or tried something different, it was because the voice told me to do it. In 1998, you guys decide that you are done with publishing a bi-monthly magazine. What was the sort of catalyst for that? Well, we started doing these books. We did the book of Rap Lists, which has lots of fun facts about hip hop and music and records, and people seemed to dig that. And we were thinking about what was next, but we had this idea to do a book about racism. So then from there, we did the big book of racism. Someone at VH1 gives it to a woman named Christina Norman, who's a big cheese. Yes. She likes the book. She then gives it out to a bunch of her staff. And someone says, hey, we should do a television show with these guys. So VH1 reaches out to us, and we did a show called TV's Illest Minority Moments, presented by Ego Trip. And so we just looked at the roles people of color have played on television over the years. That did okay. So let's do more. So then we came up with a series called race Rama, which is another exploration into race, three-part series. You mentioned politics and race humor was very central to 
sort of the latter half of Ego Trip as a magazine, and then obviously was the sort of core premise of the Big Book of Racism. Were people wrapping their heads around the satire and the commentary that you were providing? Some people didn't get it. We have a section in the book called The Yellow Pages, right? And it's about Asian culture. Now, mind you, Jeff Mao is Chinese, Brent Rollins is half Vietnamese. They're leading the charge in some of these jokes or whatever we're exploring. But the Asian woman who worked the publisher was like, I refuse to work on this. This is not cool. So it's like where we are now, like comedians can't do shit. Like imagine if that book came out now, it would be crazy. We're all very so sensitive and I think sensitivity is good, but I think there needs to be balance. Like people are too precious now. It's like, if you can't have a good racial joke with your white friend or your black friend or anyone, then we're fed. And those jokes are good only when you understand what, it's like, if I make a joke about white people, and I'm like, yeah, white people, they can't, whatever, they can't rap. It's like, no, white people can rap, that's not funny. If you make a joke about a white person who likes the Smiths and the little nuances in there that you know, that only a Smiths fan will know, that person will laugh. It's like, oh, shit, black dude knows his shit, right? And it's, for me, it's always been communication. It's like, when you like all these diverse sorts of things, it's communication, it's, it's intelligence. It gives you information that you need to survive and communicate and to make shit. And I think a lot of that is lost now. How do you process criticism? Well, I was once a critic myself. And so I come into it with a bit of an understanding of where people might be coming from. And sometimes people are coming from places that are personal to them. And sometimes their biases bleed into it. So you've got to take it with a grain of salt. If you're someone who makes art that is in the public eye, you have to be willing to accept that the public might not like it or someone in the public might not like it but you got to just stick with what your message is. And as long as you believe in what you're doing, it's all that matters. I did a series recently called Everything's Gonna Be All White. It was on Showtime. It's about race in America from the perspective of not just black people, but people of color. And um, I got barbecued by everybody, including black people, based on a trailer that they saw. They didn't even see the series. At first I was a little hurt, I guess. So like, damn, I'm on some shit, trying to like uh, make some change, but then you realize like, yo, people don't like your shit. As long as you like your shit and you stick with your shit, take a shit. So you and Ego Trip do a, a series of shows that are race focused. And then this births another piece of content that you made that I think was years ahead of its time, the White Rapper Show. Yeah. What inspired you guys uh, to make that? And how did you get it sold through? One Christmas, we were meeting with an executive from uh, a guy named Jim Ackerman at VH1. He took us out for drinks. Like, hey, you know, Race and Rama did great. What's next? What do you want to do? We're knocking them back. And I literally, I'm drunk and I'm like, yo, we should do a show called The White House. We make white people move into a house and rap. And he looked at me and said, that's a brilliant idea. And the show rated well and the show was a blockbuster. I mean, the ratings that they got then on that show, if a show got that now, I would be Dave Chappelle right now. And that led to you guys doing the Miss Rap Supreme. Yeah, well what happened was, White Rapper Show did well. New president of the company came in and said, we gotta do something that caters more towards women. Instead of following up the hit with the sequel, you guys are tasked with figuring out a way to broaden the audience and particularly to court a female viewership. Yep. Which is a challenge in anything rap related. Why would you think that a show about women in rap would do well when women in rap in real life don't do well? Now, the tables have turned, women are killing it now. They're, they're the shit. I'm glad it finally happened, but back then a show about women rappers wasn't going to be a big deal. But even those ratings compared to now, like people would kill for, the, for those ratings, but they just weren't good enough for another season. When that comes to a close, it sort of ends the chapter of Ego Trip and you guys never really collaborated again after that. Right. What happened? Um, the finale of the show, um, the, the last battle, uh, we're in LA, 
they rented us a house up in Mulholland, like fucking bawling out of control house. So we were all staying there and um, the show wraps, everyone's hugging, people are popping bottles, we're all there. Then we turn around, yo, where's Elliot? I don't know. We go back to the house, everything, he's, 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 he bounced, he's just gone. Like, oh shit, what the fuck happened? I don't know, I met with Elliot and he was like, I'm not feeling it anymore. And that's his prerogative and he has his reasons and I think ultimately he did what was best for him, which is all that matters. At that point, I was like, okay guys, let's keep going, let's keep doing this. And um, at a certain point, Ego Trip is like a, a the Flintstones car, right? Like there's no engine, it's his feet. If all the feet aren't going in the same direction, it ain't gonna move. So I think that different guys had different perspectives on what they wanted to do. So at that point, I said, well, I gotta keep on trucking. So I became a partner at a company called Roadside and we launched a production company called Automatic Films. We did a series about a black skateboarder from BET called Being Terry Kennedy. So then I moved on. I moved on to continue to do film and television after that. How do you know when to pivot? My rule is when I can no longer learn and I can no longer teach anyone anything new, it's time to move on. It's time to try something new, time to get scared a little bit. If you're not scared a little bit, then what are you doing? You go to roadside and make your first television projects as a soloist. Yep. We did a documentary for VH1 called The Origin of Me. We brought 50 Cent down to South Carolina where he learned about his ancestry. His great aunt still lived there. We found the plantation where his family worked and the same family owned the house. But working on that dock, I had the opportunity to direct for the first time. We were in this museum for an organization called the Red Shirts. The Red Shirts were the proto-clan. Before the clan, they were the Red Shirts, right? So. There's this museum, it's a tribute to the Red Shirts, right? So we go to the museum and like, Ron, the director, I don't know, he had a brain fart or he wasn't feeling it. He's like, go ahead, just go, go do it. In that moment, I had the opportunity to direct 50 and I was like, I can do this. This woman who was the curator of the museum or ran the museum was literally telling 50 Cent with a straight face that the slaves who worked here were happy. And so I say to 50 Cent, ask her, how do you know that? Well, how do you know that, ma'am? Well, because we knew them. Like, well, you're not, you're old lady, you're old as shit, but you're not old enough to know a slave, right? That doc really opened my eyes to what was possible. I mean, not that I, I had always been working towards that, always wanted to be a director or a writer or whatever, but like that moment just opened doors for me in my mind. I'm not traditionally educated, you know, everything I've ever done, I've learned on the job. One of my best friends besides history is failure. Failure is your best friend. And if you're afraid to fail, you'll never succeed. While you guys were working on those books, you started sort of a side project endeavor by linking up with Pat and Adrian from Mass Appeal. And that's sort of the beginning of this whole other part of your career that has really dominated the last like 10 to 15 years. How did that happen? Well, coming off of doing one of the first graffiti zines, at, at that point, there were way more zines happening. Mass Appeal was a zine that just kept getting better and better. And I, I spent money on it, like I liked it. And one day I just called them up. I got the voicemail and I said, listen, you don't know who I am, but I love your magazine. It's great to see the evolution. The photography is great. Keep going. That's it. I was a fan. I spent the money. I had no expectations. And they called me back and said, yeah, we know you want to hire you. I was like, nah, you can't afford me. But keep going. Keep doing it. So they kept going. They kept doing it. And I think they got to a point where they had money. They approached me again. They said, hey, man, what's up with you getting down with us now? And I said, you know what? I have an idea. I'll be the editorial director as an old ass man, and I have a young man who I think could do a great job, and that person wound up being you. Yes. So I came on as an editorial director. Noah Callahan Bever was the editor in chief. I 
liked mass appeal. I liked how it integrated all the things that I was interested in, and like graffiti and like fashion and music and like, it wasn't one thing. And I, again, connecting with my initial idea with Ego Trip, how the world was expanding and people like me weren't so weird anymore. Mass Appeal starts to really grow as a magazine for several years. Um, you know, obviously the passing of Pat was, I think, a pretty monumental setback both for the business and also for Adrian and for everyone emotionally. I mean, I think about Pat and I just laugh to myself because he's such a unique guy, funny guy. He was a good dude and when he passed away, tragically, it just changed the game. I think for Adrian it changed the game, a lot of stress. and. Uh, and magazines were starting to be in decline in terms of just people buying them, distribution. It was the, the game was changing. So I think it was 2008 when Mass Appeal shut yeah. down the magazine. So it was just time. At what point did you become a partner in Mass Appeal? Was that part of the relationship with Pat and Adrian, or did that happen afterward? Well, I was a partner with Pat and Adrian, the magazine, and then the magazine died, and so. When I joined Decon, I became a partner at Decon. And then when we started Mass Appeal, then I was a partner at Mass Appeal. Yeah, new company, new, new everything. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So, Philip Leeds, who worked for Pharrell for many years, is a friend, old friend of mine. And so I was talking to Philip, and we were talking about starting a creative agency. And he says, we should meet my friend Peter at Ben Bender. He's got a company called Decon. So we go down and meet Peter, and he's like, I know who you are. You guys have a great idea, but I, I got you by five years. Sasha, why don't you come up here? Why don't you become partner at Decon? So I was like, all right, worked it out. Came over to Decon and about six months into it, I thought about Vice and all the things Vice were doing. I remember when the Vice guys used to write to us. The Vice guys were huge fans of Ego Trip and Mass Appeal, right? Uh, they won't tell you that now, but I've, I've got letters, they called us. So I was like, wow, look what Vice has done. They, killing it, you know, gotta respect that. Well, like, why can't we do the same thing? I spoke with Peter and Peter's like, well, let's just bring Mass Appeal back. So I spoke to Adrian and got his blessing. He was happy to see it, what he had started with Pat to continue to live on. And how did you guys uh, end up getting Nas involved? You know, Peter and Nas had a bunch of interactions over the years and uh, Peter, was constantly talking to Nas about what we were doing and stuff. And um, Nas signed up and has been a very important part of the credibility. I remember having a serious meeting with Lucy in, in Universal. That was a lesson in learning how deep people's relationships are in the game. Here I was with Peter and, Lu and Nas meeting with Lucian about like doing this deal with them investing in us and like we have this big conversation and Lucian leaves the room, like we're like, looking at each other, like eating and shit, like what's gonna happen? They come back, like we're gonna do this deal. Coming from where, we, where I've come from in terms of doing magazines in my bedroom to like having people wanting to invest millions and investing millions of dollars in the company, it was super exciting. In the ensuing years, Sasha's restless curiosity would lead him to projects on subjects as varied as Wu-Tang Clan, the LA riots, and Louis Armstrong, all told with his singular understanding of culture and race and their impact on history. Sasha would also see the successful completion of a deeply personal passion project, the theatrical release of Cane River, his father's feature opus, which was lost to time in the aftermath of his unexpected death in the early 80s. To me, your piece de resistance at Mass Appeal is of Mike's and Men, which is a tremendous achievement in filmmaking on any and every level, but particularly if you know the intricacies of how Wu-Tang works. How did you manage to wrangle that situation and also to produce such a magnificent product at the end of the day? Well, my agent called Mass Appeal he was working with RZA and he was like, they're looking for a director. Do you want to put your hat, throw your hat in the ring? I was like, hell yeah. And I knew RZA a little bit from beat down and being in the game. We had many friends in common, this guy Mike McDonald, who's a graffiti writer. 
And he was their original manager, right? Yeah. When you're doing names around like Mike McDonald, they know that you know what you're talking about, right? So they're around Mike's name and other people's names and, you know, I had a conversation with Rizza and he said, you know, Ron Howard wants to do this film, right? And I said, look, love Ron Howard, he's great, but he ain't gonna do what I'm gonna do. It's just not possible. You know, I'm of this shit. I was there. When Mike McDonald was promoting Protect Your Neck, we would go out together promoting Beat Down and Protect Your Neck at record shops. Like we were hand in hand, going hand to hand with people with product. I'm like, yo, this is in my DNA. The skit on the album where uh, the radio host is like, oh, you want to hear that Wu-Tang again and again? That was at City College. And I went to City College and I was there when that call came in. I was sitting, I was cutting class when that call came in. So I'm like, yo, dude, I'm your guy for this. Like, I'll, I'll kill it. It'll be great. Trust me. So fly back the same day and got the call. Like RZA says, you're good. Do I ever get creatively blocked? Yes, it happens. And uh, you just need quiet time. Sometimes you just have to be alone with yourself and alone with your ideas. If you try to force your ideas, it's not going to work. If you have a block, you just have to slow down, reset, chill out, listen to that voice. Once again, the voice in your head is there to help you. After doing A Mike's of Men, you started working on uh, an incredibly personal project that I think sort of is a full circle moment in your career, which is getting involved in helping to facilitate the release of your father's feature film that he directed, you know, in the, I guess, months or year before he passed. Right. How did that happen? So my dad was mainly a documentary filmmaker, but ultimately he wanted to make feature films. So uh, he raised the money from one of the richest black families in New Orleans, the Rhodes family. They are in the mortuary sciences. They own funeral homes. Um, every Anyone black has been buried by the Rhodes family in New Orleans. And so they, they got behind the film. Before he died, he was close to getting distribution for it. Richard Pryor really wanted to help get it out there, but um, the patriarch of the Rhodes family did not want to lose control. So he kind of vetoed it. Then my dad died. And then we go to the funeral and people are like, we're gonna pay for your college and the film is gonna do da, da, da. And then like, nothing happened for years. So I don't know, six years ago, I just Googled my, I Googled my dad randomly. And I find an article in the Times about a place called Indie Collect, and they're an organization that works with orphan films, films that are just out there and no one knows much about them. And this place, Do Art, where they process all the film, had storage of all these films and they were getting rid of it. They were shutting that floor down, they need to get rid of all these films. And so the Indie Collect people stumbled upon my dad's film, Cane River, and it was in the article. I reached out to Indy Collect and say I'm the son of Horace Jenkins the third and I'm a filmmaker. I was like, let's connect. So I met with them and they did a great job in sort of getting it to where it was. And I said, we've got to look at distribution. They recommended folks and then Adam Yalk's company, Oscilloscope, was interested. And when I heard that, I mean Adam Yalk was I considered him a friend, I knew him and um Obviously, he passed away, but the fact that they were interested in dist distributing my dad's film, I was like, this is coming from the great beyond. And so the film came out like uh, two weeks before COVID. It was released in theaters and then COVID hit. So if it had, would have come two weeks later, it wouldn't have had its theatrical debut. So my dad's film finally made it to theaters. That's amazing. So, and now it's on the Criterion channel. And it's, it's out there, so people dig it. For me, every shot matters. Like, who knows how much longer I'll be getting these shots. And the shots have been getting better and better, and I'm thankful, but like, I operate under the understanding of like, tomorrow's not promised, opportunity's not promised. So every opportunity I have to try to maximize. After doing that during COVID, I know you started working on the Louis Armstrong documentary that came out this spring. Yep. How did his story land on your radar and how did you wrap your head around, you know, pursuing this project? 
the nice people at Imagine Entertainment reached out to me about it, and um, I was honest. I was like, I, of course I know what everyone else knows, but I'm not super deep into Louis Armstrong. They're like, well, we did two years of research. Check all this stuff out. And when I saw the research, and when I learned about the tapes that he made at his house, like just talking shit, Louis Armstrong, that mother was hip hop, like a mother. You hear him talk, like you 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 have this squeaky clean image of like Louis Armstrong being this classy guy, and not that he wasn't classy, but like he's a regular mother who like talked that shit, and um, the guy has a very powerful presence. I mean, his house in Queens is a museum. It's as he left it. I mean, obviously, it's taken some things out, but his wife's nightgown is still on the bed. I mean, it's just like insane. And there's this room that was his favorite room. And that room was where he had his reel-to-reels and where he listened to music. And so they know the last song that he listened to before he died. And they had the actual record. We had the actual turntable. So we shot the reel-to-reels moving, right? They fixed them to get them to work. So we're like, all right, we're gonna plug in the turntable and get the thing to work. And so we plugged in the turntable. It wouldn't work. Kept trying, it wouldn't work. They unplugged it, they spun it, the record started playing. I'm, I'm, there's seven or eight people who are in the room with me. It's like, no bullshit. Like, the guy is real and present. And I was like, okay, this guy, I feel like he approves of what's going on. I'm just gonna roll with it. That's crazy. It happened with Biz Marquee. So I just finished a Biz Marquee film. And we're in Red Hook, Brooklyn at the sound stage, scouting the sound stage. I was talking about making a Biz Marquee cereal, like cereal box or like, you know, for the set, like, you know, Biz Marquee with a gold chain or whatever. Someone taps me on my shoulder and like, look over there. There's a homeless man with a shirt off with a gold chain, fat dookie rope. Like, when do you ever see homeless people with gold chains? These things come from like elsewhere and I just roll with it. With both those projects, you're dealing with a protagonist who is no longer with us. And obviously, in both instances, there's a you know depth of archival footage. But as a filmmaker, how does that change your approach to the storytelling um, and, and crafting the narrative? Thankfully, in the case of Rick James and Armstrong and Biz, there's a wealth of like they're in their own word stuff out there, right? And so once you get familiar with their in their own word stuff, you start to paint a picture of who you think they are. And once you have that picture, based on what seems to sync up with what you believe, based on what you hear, then it becomes much easier to sort of craft something that feels like them. You talk to people who knew him, you talk to people who you don't expect, it's always the unexpected. And so when you interview Rakim, you go back to his high school, and he tells you, I met him in this lunchroom, and he just, you know, everyone tells the story about how Biz, they met Biz in, his, in, their, in their lunchrooms, but he didn't go to their school. That was his hustle, lunchrooms, right? So you learn this stuff and you're with Rakim at his old high school and he's sitting there and you ask him that question, you know, as an interviewer. So where were you when, when you heard he passed away? And he just like starts wailing, right? Like, he says, right here is where I went. And I just got chills. Like, and he's not like, he's not like, nah, cut off the cameras and none of those. He was having like a vulnerable moment, like, because he was in his pain. I was like, Fuck. like, I had the idea to go back to the high school, but I had no idea that it was going to be this. And like, when do you ever see men, but black men in general, crying on camera? It's those moments that make you feel like you're connecting with people in ways that like have value. What are the qualities about yourself that you hold on to the most tightly? I think it's most important to hold on to who you are. Honestly, I didn't figure out who I was until a couple of years ago, and it feels good to really understand and fully realize who you are, and it's powerful, but it takes, it takes a while. And so for me, holding on to who you are and understanding who you are, or going on that mission to figure out who you are is the most important thing. I know that recently you decided to step down from Mass Appeal yep. uh, as an active participant. Obviously, right. you remain a partner and right. invested in their continued success and growth. What animated that decision? A real desire to 
to focus on directing and doing something that's a little bit more boutique and not, you know, 40 employees and all that that goes with that. I feel like I'm in a stride now where with my directing, where I'm getting these opportunities and you're not gonna be here forever. You know, I'm, I'm you know, getting into my twilight years and, shit, and like, it's the filmmaking is evolving. It's getting better, right? So while I have this opportunity to focus on that, I want to do that. I think with Resurgent Pictures, uh, which is myself and Raquel Cepeda, who's my wife and who's a filmmaker, um, I think that stuff that we want to do is a little bit more uh, broad. I got to tell the Wu Tang story. I got to tell the Bismarck e story. I did a film about people who write lyrics, like the new generation of kids or people can tell those stories. But I also feel like hip hop is a marker in time. I don't believe, especially with black music, there are no genres. Jazz, Louis Armstrong caught a gun charge at 14. Riz's mother ran numbers. So did Rick James's mother. It's the same story over and over again. It's a reflection of and reaction to the environment. Hip hop and jazz and blues, it's the same shit. It's the same people going through the same shit with the same result. So with that sort of mindset, it's how I approach these films. Having the privilege to make films about black artists from different generations, not many people have had that privilege, but I realized that that access to information has led me to understand what I believe today is it's no genres. It's like, it's the same story over and over again.